Hello, and welcome to Controversies in Church History. I am Derek Taylor, your host for this podcast. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening, as usual. Or if you like the podcast, please go to my anchor page and subscribe, or subscribe on any of your favorite platforms. Go to YouTube, YouTube channel, where I post the post the podcasts. Um, go like the Facebook page. Go to my um, webpage, uh, churchcontroversies.com. I have some stuff on there. Uh, blog, uh, links to articles I've written elsewhere, so good stuff like that, and uh, yeah, please please uh, support our efforts here, but thank you all for listening, really appreciate it. So this is a special episode I've been kind of like hinting at for the last few weeks. Someone uh, on my Facebook page asked for, because I mentioned it in one of the podcasts, my conversion story because I was an atheist before I became Catholic. So this is your, this is, this is in response to that. So uh, yeah, if you have, if you have, by the way, if you have ideas, uh, let me know. I'll try to try to do those at some point. So I have done, uh, people have, have also asked for certain things. They'll, they're coming, by the way, they're longer series that I ask for. So they'll take a little longer to get to finish. But, but here it is, the story of my conversion how I came into the Catholic Church. So I guess I should start with the personal background. I am from Tampa, Florida. I was born in Tampa, Florida in 1978 in St. Joseph's Hospital. Uh, but no, it was not Catholic. It was a Baptist hospital in Tampa, Florida. I, uh, I am the second of three siblings, older brother, younger sister, uh, mother and father have been married. They're still married today. I think this is over. They have already had their 50th wedding anniversary. So, come from that background. Uh, I grew up in what I would think as a a sort of more or less standard suburban middle class home in Tampa until I was about 10 years old. I was 10. We moved to Central Florida, and uh, I guess. You know, uh, in terms of like religion or God and me as a child, I would say all my family, immediate family believes in God. None of them, by the way, except for me are Catholic. The only person I had in my immediate family who was Catholic, I didn't really understand this until I was in my teens, was my grandmother, who since passed away, God rest her soul, was from New Orleans. Um... My my father had actually been baptized, actually baptized Catholic. My grandmother made him do that, but uh, basically he stopped going after a certain period. They got married in the Catholic Church, did my mother and father. My mother is a uh, Presbyterian. <clears throat> I think it was her idea. I don't know this for a fact that we go to churches to church until I, and we did until I was about ten years old. Protestant churches. I think we went to her Presbyterian church, if I recall correctly. And then um, we stopped going when I was 10 years old. My dad said I didn't have to because <laughs> me and my brother wanted to stick around and watch NFL football games. So that was the end of <laughs> that church experience as a child. I, I should also point out I did go to a briefly to a Catholic school for kindergarten, where my only real memory is I had a teacher who was kind of mean to me. <laughs> Name was Mrs. Perry. I remember these odd memories. I remember doing something, whatever you're doing, playtime, you're supposed to draw something. I think I was supposed to draw something religious, and I didn't. <laughs> I remember taking a yellow crayon and drawing instead. If you've ever seen the movie, uh, it's a Cold War movie called Firefox. Clint Eastwood is this spy who's sent to steal this Russian plane. So I was drawing, I've seen the movie, and I liked it. So I uh, I drew the plane, and my, my teacher got mad at me. My father, <laughs> my, fa my father took the, I was, I was really upset about it. He's a little kid, and she kind of yelled at me. But uh, I remember my father, like, God, this is terrible, but, you know, making me feel better by mocking her. Uh, she had kind of a big nose, so he referred to her as Miss Horseface Perry. <laughs> it's kind of terrible when I think about it. If you're still out there, Mrs. Perry, I apologize. By the way, I was, I, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say I was the worst kid, but I'm not a kid, like, you know. So, um, like most people have my faults. But anyway, I don't blame her for it at all. But, um yeah, I'm trying to remember other things. It's been a long time. I'm 44 years old. I should have mentioned that as well. So, so when I was a child, I do remember when I was a child, I don't remember, I don't remember what I even felt about going to to these churches. I do remember at one point, again, in this Presbyterian church my mother took to, they, you, they took a form of communion 
And I remember being upset because I couldn't take the wine. They had little wine cups or whatever. I think they use wine. I cannot recall for their service. Other thing I remember uh, as a child was going to, it was well, kind of associating churches with death. The reason being, because when I was very young, four or five, I went with my family to my great grandfather's funeral and went to they went to see his casket and it was in a church and so you know as a, as, a, as a child that kind of creeped me out I didn't like death I still don't like death obviously but um I kind of so I had it was a negative association is my point it's kind of like ugh, death you know and I don't really know I'm, I'm trying to this is vague stuff I'm talking about I was about one or ten one to ten years old and just not really you know uh, I didn't have a real great religious sense. I remember sitting in the backyard in Tampa. We moved several places, but we had a hammock. You know, we had trees outside, and I was sitting in a hammock. I remember thinking about God and trying to, like, I was eight or, eight or nine years old, something like this, and thinking about God and wondering what came before God and what, what how did that, and, and it, basically breaking my brain by doing that and not really understanding and kind of getting tired of it really quickly. I, you know, I remember even... Um, uh, as a child, though, when I talk about Catholic influences, not many, not many. I remember, uh, I think I saw in a movie somewhere, somebody kneel before a cross and cross themselves. So again, my my uh, my mother's Presbyterian church had a, on the side of it had a big cross, a steel cross. I remember going like kneeling before it for some reason. I think I was going to anyone I saw in the movie when I was a kid. That's about it. Um, that's about it until, um, until later in life. And kind of what um you know kind of what sort of you know led me on to this this path that I eventually got into to Catholicism probably had to do with uh probably had to do with adolescence um adolescent you know uh, you, know, you hit puberty things change uh I don't want to say puberty ruins everything but it did kind of I did change a lot I remember going through that and feeling it too like I was a more open I was a more talkative child but puberty kind of made me kind of, you know, withdrawn, um, a little bit morose, you know, the, the, you know, that, that, it's a lot of people go through that, obviously. Also, maybe a very self-aware, you know, I was never terribly aware of, you know, how I looked at the people before I had puberty. You become aware where you look, where you dress, you know, you know, um, criticisms about that begin to hit you differently. Uh, and anyway, I'm not going to go into too much personal detail here, but um, I'm going to skim over this, but basically I, I, get, I just became, I think I became, maybe, I was diagnosed with it later on, uh, sort of adolescent depression. And I, I pretty much, buy, for a lot of different reasons, I won't go into all the personal things here, but I, you know, you're young, you don't know your place in the world. Uh, well, I will say a few things. Again, I was a young, intelligent child, you know, whatever, tested for gifted, all that stuff. But being a young boy, I was not athletic. I wasn't into cars. You know, I liked to read books. It was, you know, you're not necessarily as masculine as maybe you'd want to be. And so you kind of, I mean, I felt kind of felt lost. But uh, I began to be, you know, I'd say by the end of high school, I was a very, I think, very depressed. And then two, by the end of my high school years, for reasons I won't go into, because probably because I was so unhappy, I basically lost any sort of. Um, belief in a deity. Um, I, I would probably say, I thought of myself as an atheist. I, I would call myself that. I certainly lived uh, and felt like God did not exist. And again, I will say this is not so much, this is, you know, like your high school. So uh, it was more a matter of emotion than reason. I feel awful. Therefore, God does not exist. Is <laughs> kind of ba the basic premise of that unbelief. Um, you know, it was, I don't know. I, mean, I, I always felt kind of ashamed of it, too. I never revealed this to my parents, never told them that. Um, I think it was partly related to the depression because, well, I didn't reveal it to my, to my, this unbelief to my parents because I felt like, well, like telling them something like that. It's almost like telling them they failed as parents or something like that. Or, but I had never told most people that. I, I just assumed it went on living. Um, and when I say I, I cease to believe in God, I, it's a very... Again, it's, it's 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 sort of the word, the concept, God, and sort of entails anything like a purpose or meaning in life. 
uh, all that in my mind went with it. Once you, once you know, once you know, um, once that goes, once the belief in that personal God goes, to me, all purpose went with it. And it probably, you know, I'm trying to remember now. It's hard to remember, but it's probably, you know, I probably prayed at some point, got no answer, didn't understand that, so I figured, like, okay, nobody's answering. There's nobody there, right? It was not a terribly sophisticated, you know, reaction to the old this, but. Um, I don't know. Sometimes I, I think I, I, you know, I go back and forth and wonder if I really, you know, were you really an atheist? I actually respect um, atheists, at least not not the you know brainless new atheist types, the yellers and the screamers. I'm talking about the ones who are considered, you know, that's philosophers, people like that. They have reasons for what they do. I didn't really have, other than that, I didn't really have much of a reason. I didn't think you had to have those. <laughs> I never met anybody who had. My father was not in my background, like. We had a lived in a nice middle class home. My father was, you know, never went to college. Um, and was a law maintenance business. So nobody in my family, I, basically the only person in my family who graduated from college, immediate family, was my uncle. And nobody, as you're going to see, nobody, uh, except a very distant relative in Louisiana, ever went to graduate school. Because I came out of high school not knowing what it was I wanted to do with my life. That's kind of connected to, to all this, to the religious uncertainty. And going where I did, I went to the University of Florida, which, if you don't know, is a really big university. They capped enrollment years ago at like 46,000. It would be way up there, or 70. It would be huge if they could accept more people in there. But even at the time, I think it was 42,000 students in 1996. Graduated from high school in 96. Um, and, uh, yeah, the first few years at that... Um, at uh, UF were, you know, eight, I don't know, 18 to 20 years old, something like that. When I get there, my birthday's in June. Uh, the size of UF, I mean, it's just huge. <laughs> uh, it was huge. It was hard. It was it's a big, it's a big campus. So it's, you know, it takes time to get from one end of the campus to the other. You know, it sort of exacerbated my sense of isolation, my social anxiety, which was also a big problem at the time. In fact, it was so big, I, I, I majored in English. We'll get to that in a second, but I, I think I had maybe a couple of classes in English in my major, my major courses, where I had people that I knew from other classes. Just the size of the place was so big. You didn't see people like from one class to the other. It was that big. I didn't live on campus. I lived at home for the first two years before I moved to Gainesville, so I was kind of disconnected. Didn't make many, very many friends there. Again, my anxiety and my, you know, all of those sorts of things got in the way of that. And um, so it was a tough, it was a tough time. And the biggest thing is, again, because you don't know where you're going, what your place in the world is, those sorts of things. You know, I went to UF, the idea, look, I was, you know, I was intelligent, going to be an intelligent person, you're going to do something, whatever, whatever it is intelligent people do. And, um, you know, when I went there, I thought all my professors were atheists. And therefore, if I was going to be a learned person, quote unquote, I needed to be an atheist too. So I needed to go on with this. There was no point in looking for other things. And so you basically imitate people you want to be like, obviously, as a child. And so that combined with um, something else that happened, which is academia is a serious challenge, obviously, to most of you listening probably cradle classics, I assume, like secular universities can be a challenge to people's faith. Well, my problem was it exacerbated greatly my condition. Uh, I, you're confronted with ideas I had never heard of when I went into, into to university. Um, you know, relativism, moral relativism in a philosophical sense. Historicism, um, that's the idea that every, there's one version of this, one idea that every single Historical epic is unique and un, almost unknowable to every other. So it's, it kind of goes along with that relativism. It's a real, it's a denial of anything like, you know, absolute or, you know, unchanging truth, I guess. And then things like nihilism, right, which you encounter obliquely. And then stuff I was reading on my own outside of class. And all of this sort of confirmed me in my atheism by sort of poisoning my mind even further. It gave me rational reasons why I was believing what I was believing. And so it confirmed me, yeah, there's no eternal truth, there's no life after death. It made me much more miserable than I already was. <laughs> In fact, I didn't want to believe those things, um, but I did. I will say this, that I, I did encounter 
uh, thinkers, most everybody did by the mid-1990s as an undergraduate, that constellation of ideas we sometimes call postmodernism. And it did have something of a providential effect. This postmodernism tends to undermine aspects of modern thought that you know go along with other things I just mentioned. So, But, however, this was actually important for me because university study made me think about all these issues, truth, knowledge, God, obliquely, uh, in a self-conscious way I never had done before. And I do not think I could have ever, I don't, I don't think I would have escaped my adolescent atheism if I had not been challenged by all this stuff. And so I'm very grateful to God that I was challenged in this way. In any event, I mentioned I, I became a, I was, went into study literature. Uh, I liked reading books. And, you know, not just, you know, my dad started me reading, God, I started reading like Stephen King novels when I was 10 years old. But in high school, I got to start reading, you know, you know, literature, stuff like Charles Dickens, stuff like that, Shakespeare. And um, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I thought maybe I'll teach or something. I just like reading books. <laughs> that was, I didn't really give it much thought. Most people don't, obviously. But I kept my same major all four years, which is better than most people. And, but the study of literature would become important for me um, because it became, I was drawn, I didn't know at the time, to the Catholic faith through the literature, particularly of an earlier era, because I began when I went there the first couple of years, especially my, jun my junior years when things began to change in my life. But my original plan had been to study American literature, but it was so study of literature had become even by then in an undergraduate setting so politicized i tried to avoid it by going and studying british literature instead in a course on modern british poetry and like poetry um i discovered the um the writer and uh, poet t.s Eliot. t.s Eliot, if you know is an anglican <clears throat> literary, literary uh, poet and literary critic and I read his Wasteland. I remember reading his Wasteland for the first time in an American lit class and like being almost like nauseated by him. It was like, what is this? You know, it is modernism. So, but I, after I ran it a second time for a sec the second course, I began to enjoy it and study it. But through him, but also through his literary criticism, I discovered 17th century English poets, uh, sometimes called the metaphysical poets, people like John Donne, George Herbert. Uh, who are their, they write religious works, they write other stuff as well, but they're overtly, overtly religious poets, and became fascinated by them, they're great poets, by the way, just to read, and through them I began to find an interest, okay, in the background of the time, because that's one of the things uh, T.S. Eliot was on about, is that something changed in literature in the 17th century, and so this was important for you know, kind of waking me to other things. I should also mention, just in passing, that it's, it's odd, you know, things Think, things catch you, and I recognized it at the time, but especially much later, I remembered this. In that modern literature course, I had to read a poet named Philip Larkin. Philip Larkin's a modern you know, 20th century poet laureate, 1960s-ish, 1560s in Britain, and Larkin was a, a librarian primarily, but he wrote poetry, but he was also an atheist. And I remember I had to read one of these poems Maybe I didn't. I can't remember whether I read it for the class or just read it. But I had a book of his collected poem, and the 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 poem was called "Church Going." And um, uh, it, one of the things that uh, the poem, you know, I read the poem. Right, the reason why I remember it so much is because it begins. It talks about him. You know, it's called "Church Going." Larkin goes to this old abandoned church. He goes in. He walks around. He goes to the ambo and says it pronounces a few words. Here's an echo. I'm paraphrasing from memory, but you can go look it up. It's a good poem. But uh, and then says, you know, has some line about uh, the emptiness of the silence there, right? The idea, the whole point of the idea of that po first part of the poem that sets you up is that well, religion's dying, right? And I come here just to see the ruins of it, basically. And it's again, it's the kind of poem that would have really exacerbated my condition because I. And I was an atheist, and I was living that way, mainly because I thought it was true. I didn't want it to be true. And whenever I read something like this, where I thought, "Oh my God, they're gonna, you know, reconfirm for me that this is all, this is all rot," in other words, as the Brits would say, the second part of that poem turns, and he starts talking about how, um, maybe remember the line, 
and it pleases me to stand in silence here. He talks about Larkin in the, in the poem, how he likes coming to this place. And towards the end of it, he builds up, he starts talking about all the things that used to go on in the church. And uh, you know, we think about baptisms and all the things that go on in a church. A church. But this is, a, this is probably, I don't know, he's not talking about any specific building. It's probably a Church of England church. But um, by the end of it, he talks about how he's almost gotten into a, a reverie about, I can't how to put this. He talks about the church as being, um, I can remember this line particularly. Um, oh, God. A serious house on serious earth it is, where all are where all our compo where all our uh, where all our compulsions meet and are robed as destinies or something like that. And again, it's not like he has some conversion and belief, but you can tell that was maybe the first time in this environment where I thought everybody was atheist. They weren't, by the way. Um, someone expressed respect for religion of any kind, and it ends that way. The poem does. It's kind of, I was like, I was very it was surprised. I remember that because that was actually important to me at the time. This little poem about Phil Phil Walker. And you should read some of his stuff. It's good. He he's kind of famous for writing that. Some I don't remember saying that. He writes like he uses like curse where he, he drops the f bomb a lot in some of his poems. Those aren't his best poems. He also does some stuff about sex. Eh. But other 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 part other poems of his are really good. So anyway, that's Larkin. And uh, I remember at one point I took a Victorian lit class and discovered the word agnosticism that had been coined by um, Sir Thomas Huxley, so defender of, of Charles Darwin in the 19th century against religious critics. And I remember being like really impressed by the fact he coined a, wor a word, right? Because I love words and reading. And so I was like, I kind of, I kind of thought, should I adopt that? I like the word. I remember writing an essay on Huxley for that class and my teacher, Patricia Craddock, uh, gave me an A for the A for the essay. I remember this because it stuck out in my mind. She said, "Well, I don't agree with you on this." She meant agnosticism. I was like, "Huh? She's a believer or something?" Uh, I remember her name because it turned out later on, much later on, I found her singing in, in the, the local Catholic Catholic student Catholic student center, the choir. So <laughs> this is something I had no inkling of um, this time period. I also want to mention one other person. Uh, Jim Paxson, who was a teacher of medieval literature. I took his class, really liked it. Um, I say this because he passed away about 10 years ago. I still get emails from the, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at UF. I don't know why, but he passed away, so God rest his soul. And I, all this stuff was, you know, uh, good for me and providential in the long run. But what really began to sort of uh, plant the seed in, in my, especially my junior year, was history. Um, that's how I got into it was getting me on the path there. And uh, by my junior year, 1998, 1999, that year, I knew I wanted to study more history. Uh, I thought maybe double majoring. That sounded like a lot of work. <laughs> I'm kind of lazy. So I knew I could minor in it. So I didn't take courses to fit my schedule. So that fall, the only course that fit my schedule was the history of medieval England. And I was really bummed about this. I wanted to take a U.S. Civil War class. That sounds much more fun when you're a kid, a young dude, especially when you're not much of a fighter yourself. You like reading about fighting. Uh, in any case, but I had to take the courses. I only to think things fit my schedule, so I did. And this is where I met the professor, John Somerville. And um, uh, Somerville uh, was a good lecturer. Um, other people thought he was boring. I thought he was good. But the main thing is um, the significance of the class was John, and he later became one of my mentors. That's why I call him by his first name. So John, in his lectures, never promoted Christianity or anything like that. He was um, Protestant, Methodist. Um, but he did something much more simple, which was providential for my life. When he talked, especially about the medieval church, especially about the medieval church, this is about medieval religion, it's all Catholic. It's customs, you know, you, you expect to hear, like you're just waiting for, when you go, you know, even as someone who didn't believe, I didn't want to hear how stupid everything was in the Middle Ages, I didn't want to hear it's all gone, now, all that stuff. Uh, he didn't do anything special, he just treated it with respect. Like, this was this an impressive institution, this is this is these impressive beliefs, he, he respected it, he obviously did. In fact, more than that, he, this came out, if you listen to his, more of his lectures, you kind of listen to this. I, th I think, I don't think he ever told me, I think he was doing this on purpose to draw people in. I think one of the things he wanted to do. 
was um, he he never, he never spoke this openly, but all he lectured, all of his lectures, he assumed that religion in general was a normal and natural part of life. This meant the world to me. Um, because again, I thought everybody there was an atheist. As I learned later, of course, lots of them weren't, but you can't, it's hard to kind of say that openly or too openly. It, even back then, in the middle of the 1990s, it's almost today, unless you're just very, very liberal, it's not a good idea. Um, and so that was providential. More than that, his description of medieval England, especially the church, was just so alluring to me, right? It seemed to have, like, because one of the things I, I, again, one of the things that became to be, want to study to think about why I got into literature or history is why did this happen if the world really is just an empty void how do we how do we get to that how do we how does society go from believing there was this god and there was this hope and all this stuff to, to not that generally vague I never never conscious but generally it was in my mind how did it come to that and, you know uh, it, it planted the seeds of this in my mind and loved the class so much, I went up taking the entire site, one of the three classes you could take at UF, medieval, early modern England, and then modern Britain. And it both planted in my mind scenes of the church, but also made me change my, my intention. I, mean, I wanted to teach history instead of literature. And I say this all the time. I, I was still going through lots of struggles, uh, obviously. Um, and all this, by the way, was primarily intellectual and historical at this point in my in my life. Um, I was happily happy to believe religion had been a, important in the past for the civilization on the part of Western civilization. Uh, did that mean I had any inkling of personal belief as of yet? Doesn't mean I didn't want to, but I didn't. I, I simply couldn't. Um, it's kind of hard to explain, but I do recall like trying to like pray. I remember I have, I still have my old, <laughs> which I got like in the first grade, my old, because I went to a, a, a Baptist school, um, my old copy of the King James Bible and reading through it, reading the Beatitudes and having to hold back tears because I thought the words were so beautiful, but that they expressed something that could not be true. So this is something you know, I'm still struggling with. And I, again, I'll, I'll, I'll say it again. I never wanted, I never wanted to believe these things. And this is, you know, again, I, you can kind of tell from what I've said already, I don't have, I probably looked a little too harshly on my earlier beliefs because I didn't think through them. But I'll give myself credit for this. Um, the reason why, you're asking why, why would you keep, if it makes you miserable, why do it? Well, the reason why is I thought it was true. I thought it was true. And if it's true, it doesn't matter if it makes you miserable. And, you know, um, it didn't make me, by the way, suicidal. That's totally the opposite. I was terrified to die. Because I mean, you, you don't want to be annihilated because you don't believe there's any afterlife. But um, but it's still the whole the whole thought of it horrified me. That's why it horrified me. Uh, I sort of clung to life in a real petrified existence. It was awful. And um, but if it was true, that's all that mattered. And I think maybe there's something in that of that again that adolescent. You know, you don't feel like a you don't feel like a real man. So I think I made up for it by being this horrific, <laughs> embracing this horrific belief system and suffering through it. Maybe that's a, a way of compensating for my lack of masculinity or something. I have no idea. Um, but um, again, one of the challenges I mentioned, I mean, it was a good thing to be challenged, but one of the challenges all my study presented me with was that it instilled into me the idea that religion, faith, whatever, were in, inevitably doomed to pass away. Because it seemed all, all around me that it was passing away at that point. And the logic of this line of thinking, that it was historically inevitable, um, was very powerful. Partly because it was never really articulated clearly, rarely articulated clearly and openly. But it was more often taught subliminally, you know, like by suggestion. And not just, you know, life after death or the supernatural in general. I remember picking up a book, it's probably later on, but it was by a philosopher, Richard Rorty. And um, famous, long story. Anyway, the beginning of his book, he makes this offhand comment about ideas that are basically, I'm paraphrasing, but ideas that are basically incoherent, like the idea of infinity, right? That's one of the traditional attributes of, of God and traditional, you know, scholastic theology. And I mentioned that because he didn't make any argument against it. He just sort of 
he just sort of dismiss, dismissed it out of hand. It's not making it, it's not an argument, it's hand waving. But again, when you're in an environment when you're young, you don't know anything, that has stuff has a powerful impact on you. And that's what prevented me from accepting any personal belief, any belief in a, per, a deity at that point. You know, this is around 1988, 89, uh, 89, 2000, like this. And um, yeah, and so I needed to have that, you know, that was a big, big, you know, I say a big bar at the time, it didn't seem possible that it could be wrong. We got into my final year of study, and then a little later on, I, I had a decision to make, right? I didn't want to teach high school. I knew that. I didn't want to have to, you know, babysit a bunch of people all the time. And I wanted the kind of intellectual stimulation you can only get in university. So, you know, <clears throat> um, my classes convinced me I should go into history and then maybe go into collegiate teaching. And by the way, I found other mentors as I went through college, uh, one of whom was, uh, again, I mentioned them to praise them. Um, and other these people, by the way, other than John Somerville, were far, not as far as I'm aware, religious at all. But one of them was Ira Clark, uh, was a teacher, English teacher, but taught Shakespeare. And um, I wound up taking a course with him in graduate school as well. But he, uh, uh, I need to praise him because he taught me how to read and love Shakespeare, which has just been a, um, a great blessing in my life. So I'm going to remember him. I, I don't know if he's still alive, but. In any case, all this convinced me, even though I was loving Shakespeare, I didn't need to study history. In particular, again, that question of how did society get this way, go from believing like this to not believing this. And that the whole period of the early modern era, the Reformation and the intellectual like revolutions of the 17th century seemed like a good place to study the origins of our modern quote unquote secular society. And I wanted to understand how it came about and I wanted to understand if it really was irreversible. And, um, and you know, because the religious question was still hanging over me, even though, again, I was not practicing or believing at all at that point. And uh, John Summer wrote a book, which I can still kind of recommend to you. That's like, oh, God, it's over 20, it's almost 25 years old. Um, he wrote a book on the rise of, like, print media in the 17th century in England, uh, newspapers. Uh, it was called How the News Makes Us Dumb. It's a good book. Um, but part of its point was that modern societies with their emphasis on, you know, timeliness with periodical schedules that tends to obliterate any sort of, you know, um, sense of eternity. And I began to think, oh, maybe, okay, maybe that's, maybe that's correct. Maybe it's just, you know, this isn't the natural end of society there. That's one thing. But probably the most important book I read that began to sort of, you know, make cracks in that that narrative about society's inevitable decline into secularism and stuff like that. It was a book I read, and I don't remember when I read it. I think I read it in 1999. I tried to find, I actually looked this up. I tried to find, like, you can go to Amazon and look at old orders. I think I bought it from Amazon, and they couldn't bring it up. Um, but I think it was 1999. I think it was, it was either the last year of college or the year after. But I read this book by an Anglican theologian, not a Catholic theologian, named John Milbank called Theology and Social Theory. And it's actually a really badly edited collection of essays. All of his books are badly, poorly edited collections of essays. I don't know who edits his books, but they're terrible. <laughs> this is awful to read. Anyway, the point was, the book is what is sometimes referred to in the academy as a genealogy of the, the discipline of sociology. Genealogy means sort of like a a narrative, an unmasking narrative, where you you show where you know discipline like sociology has a has a, a narrative it presents about itself. He shows a narrative saying it had, its narrative is actually false. And what he, his basic argument was that sociology, because sociology presumed you know um, a secular world, right, and the inevitability of secularization. And so his argument was that encoded in the the basic principles of the of the worldview underpinning sociology were theological principles mostly liberal Protestant ones, but um, that was his argument. And I cannot stress, I cannot stress the importance of this book enough for my life. And I say this because I've read several books since then. I've grown a lot since then. I honestly don't think Milbank's much of a theologian, to be honest with you. Uh, and he has never become Catholic. Uh, he he made noises, like in the book, he identifies himself as, a, as an Anglo-Catholic. This is a sort of a faction within the Church of England, which is kind of 
high church, if you know what the word means. And um, I realize now that partly his book was kind of a pose, but it was a pose that was meant to, <laughs> I say a pose because he's part of what's called, if you know what radical orthodoxy is, it's a movement among almost, into, well, there are some Catholic scholars, mostly Protestant scholars, Anglican ones, to sort of utilize postmodern thought to undermine some of the assumptions of modernist thought of, again, stuff like, you know, secularization theory, stuff like this. And it was it was intended to catch, I think, graduate students uh, on their way to their careers, trying to catch them from, you know, losing their faith before they went to those 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 um, environments, those secular environments, and give them a narrative from which to criticize the seemingly impervious arguments about the inevitability of religious decline. And um, I realize as I've gotten older, some of the arguments he makes are kind of weak. The basic premise is correct, by the way. Everything has theology. I mean, every, it's, it's almost kind of not really a, a big, it's not really a great argument, right? Because most disciplines, if you look back far enough, there's a genealogy of religious ideas behind them. So it's not a great argument. But it, the book was a godsend to me. Um, I remember at that point, I, I, think it, I think it may have been because of that book that I made, started making a self-conscious effort to try to pray again. Because it convinced me that, okay, okay, it's intellectually defensible to doubt this narrative. And so I, I, this is, I, I doubt, I, I'm almost certain I never would have entered the church or probably embraced any sort of organized religion and had been reading this book. Again, somewhere around 1999, 2000, I think. And I say this, by the way, because Mil <laughs> Milbank basically, uh, a lot of his stuff today, I mean, he, he quite frankly embraces heresy. Um, I believe the, his latest iteration of this is that he's embraced some sort of universalism, denial of the reality of hell, in other words. So I don't want to say anything about that. And if, but I, I, I'm eternally grateful to the man. I wish I could shake his hand. Uh, I, I could not have come where I, I have come without that book. Uh, and if, by the way, you're wondering, you're probably wondering this, a uh, couple of things. Um, because when I tell this story, usually people are like, well, what Catholic books read you, led you to the church? And the answer is none. <laughs> and the reason why is pretty simple. At this point, my question was not uh, which church is, church is the true church? Why is Catholicism true and Protestantism false? Why Catholicism rather than, say, the Orthodox? Why Christianity rather than, say, Islam or something like that? None of those questions really matter to me for a variety of reasons. The question was, does God really exist? Does he give a flip about me? <laughs> And um, that led to other involved questions: Is is there something? Is there anything beyond nature? Is the supernatural real? Is the eternal, the infinite, a real thing? Is there life after death? All those big, big questions. And the reason why Catholic ideas didn't come into it at this point is because my answers to those questions, since I was 17 years old or so, had been no. And I needed I needed reasons in in general that, that God existed in general that there was those sorts of things. Um, I needed reason to believe those answers things could be answered yes because those were the biggest hurdles. In fact, I, I'll say this today: if there's any doctrine about the Catholic faith it's, that, that I still find a little bit hard, but it sounds crazy, probably the hardest thing, is even the existence of life after death. Don't I believe it? Don't get me wrong, I'm fine. But like, it was always the hardest thing. That was the hardest thing to believe, weird as it may sound. And that's why at that point, to go back to my point here, is why books or ideas that undermined a secularizing modern narrative of the world were so much more crucial for me and that books making a positive case for Catholicism didn't matter that much. Another reason for that is that because I, again, just from studying just from studying history, and I started to read around you know, about the Reformation and stuff after I took some of those classes, I never had much doubt that if I could believe, okay, if there was a God, I did establish a church, it's never really, even though I was still completely an atheist, I never had much doubt about where that would be if you're deciding between Protestantism and, and Catholicism. Never found Protestant arguments about the Reformation convincing. Never found anything Luther had to say about the church convincing. It has always seemed to me that Luther, I think, despaired about his own salvation and at the corruption of the church. And so I think this led him to, in order to get out of his despair, 
alter the church's teachings or pretend it was something other than it was in order to get around the misery being caused by the institutional church. And, and I think uh, it, it seemed to be obvious in the long run this hadn't worked because look at the Protestant churches, they're dying off in the West too. Um, you know, sola fide, sola scriptura, just reading about it in a purely historical sense, the, the sort of subjectivism, at least tacit of it all, struck me as, it struck me as things you would only embrace if you were really desperate rather than earnest statements, earnestly statements that were supposed to be true about belief. They seemed like they were a means to an end. And nothing I have ever read or experienced since my undergrad days has really changed my mind about this. And so that's why I was desperately looking for reasons to disregard my own experience of, of despair and unbelief. Um, because I had to, that's my thing, I, I'll say this, I don't think I've ever been convinced, at least in an emotional sense, as strongly and powerfully as I was at that time, that God did not exist, that there was no afterlife. Uh, as anything in my life, I, I, that, it had such an emotional hold on me, it was that powerful. And so I was looking for anything to get around. My point is, I had to reject my own experience and find something outside of my own experience to confirm that. I needed to have certain experiences I knew, but you know, partly learning about history, it, it was in, in some ways, we'll get into this in a second one thing, but point was, but I knew if I did, if I could do that, if it were possible for intellectually defensible, and if I had you know, enough reason to do that, I, I pretty much knew where I would go. Now, about I graduated in 2000 from UF to get back on the narrative. I still didn't know what the hell I was doing. I took a year off, and um, I taught. Uh, I taught at uh, what was back then called, I'm so old, back then called Santa Fe Community College in Gainesville, Florida. What is now called Santa Fe College It's still a community college. They took the community out because I guess it sounds less, I guess there's a stigma um, associated with community colleges. I teach at one, so obviously I don't care, but. I taught in the college prep program there, which the college prep program is a nice word for remedial program, meaning we let you in to the community college because we have to take you, but you need to learn how to read and write better. And so I taught reading and writing classes there. And I have to tell this story because this is, I'm still, I'm still trying and I'm, I'm making efforts, sort of efforts to pray, still don't believe in a God. And um, I never taught before. You know, I'd given reports before class in um, in um, in college. Done okay. I was nervous, but I didn't realize what kind of problems I had with anxiety <laughs> until I started teaching. And well, I'll just go through what happened. I, I, I first day of class, I go that go to go to campus, and I'm, well, I should step back for a second. I was so terrified of teaching, I did not sleep the night before. Went 24 hours without sleep. Uh, and I, I, I just, I was just terrified of going in front of that class and trying to teach anything. And I'll never forget it because I got to school. I thought, somebody had told me, so I read somewhere, like, you know, you're nervous, but once you get into the class, you'll be fine. You, you know, it'll be, everything will be fine. You'll talk, start talking and then it'll go away. <laughs> I remember walking, I was meeting with some of my colleagues at this computer lab before class, and I remember saying goodbye and going off to class. I'll never forget walking to that classroom with those horrible, like, those whatever lights, those those buzzing, whatever long pole lights overhead. You know the kind I'm talking about. That buzzing sound. As I walked toward the class, my heart started pounding harder and harder and harder. I thought I might actually, like, burst a blood vessel or something. I went in that classroom, and I walked in, and I saw all these kids sitting there. And there was a chair in front of a desk in front of the class. And I went and sat down, and I didn't get back up, because I don't think I could have stood at that point. In fact, I, I think I went through whatever spiel I had to go through, I handed out some stuff, and after 10 minutes I let them go, and I thought I was going to physically collapse. I don't know how I still, I, I, I don't know how I got through it. It, uh, it was, I mean, you know, my clothes, I had another class to teach after that didn't go quite as badly. 
but you know, my my armpits were completely was like soaked. I mentioned all this because it was like I remember that, I remember before several years before that reading somewhere that you know surveys show people consistently you give them a choice. <clears throat> Would you rather die or would you rather do public speaking? And it almost always comes out, it's not even close. People would rather die than speak in public. And I have to say, after having gone through that experience, that first time in front of that classroom, the way I was then, you give me a choice, you can go through death or you can go do that experience again, I would choose death. It was Horror. It was, you know, the thing is, I used to say, I used to say to people, I remember saying somewhere, this is the worst experience of my life. And then he pointed out to me, he's like, you know what? No, it isn't. It's your best. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, you got through it. I didn't feel that way at the time, but I, I think he's basically right, whoever that was that told me that. And I said this because I still didn't believe it. And that's one thing you're going through is like, why would God let me experience all that? It's, again, it's, it's a simplistic reaction to that. It's not really God's fault. But I, long story, but you get the idea. That was a, that was a turning point because... Honestly, nothing I have experienced since then, with one exception, has come close to that um, in terms of just being a horrible experience. Um, but it was big for me because I did. I learned to survive, by the way, by I, to this day, I take um, various things to get to sleep and I sleep very poorly. So, But I did it. And the next year I re-enrolled to go back to graduate school. Um, the master's program at UF, I was going to get my master's degree. John Summerlin will be my my graduate my, my master's degree advisor. And it's at this point where things kind of the the thing the change happens. I enrolled in two, fall 2001 still trying to pray and failing. I remember at one point like the most I could manage to say basically was I think thank you God or something like this. But I didn't really feel thankful. <laughs> I was like, I was basically just awful and wanted relief. Uh, I wanted God, if he existed, to actually like, you know, help me not feel so miserable. And I remember the dates for a reason, because this is 2001. And this was, a, I'll start it here. This is Sunday before Tuesday, September 11th, 2001. That Sunday previous to the terrorist attacks in the United States, I was up, God almighty, I was up at 1 a.m., couldn't sleep, and I was watching, I was watching, of all things, C-SPAN 3. <laughs> I'm laughing. This is terrible. I was watching, there was a, I'll never forget it, there was a, a physicist, Steven Weinberg, he's dead now, there's a famous Nobel Prize winning physicist, uh, on C-SPAN 3, hawking a book on atheism. And again, like hearing this stuff, you know, it just made me, it, it sort of tore at my soul to hear this stuff and want, listening to him do that. And like, I got so, I guess like one thirty in the morning now, I listen to this, I don't know why I'm listening to this book presentation, this awful book with this, I'm sure he was a nice man, but he had this really monotone, like, um, 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 I mean, it was like, it was just weird. Anyway, my point is I was so, I was, I was just, I went through again, this sense of like, you know, despair because you don't believe in any purpose. You don't believe in life. Are you terrified of death? I remember at that moment, I was like, okay, okay, I'm, this, I've had enough. God, if you exist, please give me a clear sign. A clear sign that you really do exist. Can't take this anymore. And I don't know, I, I don't know what, I would have gone on suffering. I wouldn't have been doing this. There's no way I would have committed suicide. But wanted to, I'll say that. Um, don't, don't give me some, you know, some sign where like the wind blowing the leaves, something where somebody, I think I remember they using these words, ask me directly somehow that you want me to believe in or words that are. So two days later, I woke up in the morning, it was the first, supposed to be the first day of classes at UF. Um, I remember like I was laying around on the couch in my, I had a mobile home, I was living in a mobile home at the time in Gainesville. And, you know, you turn on the TV and there's something going on with you. I don't know. I'm not even paying much attention. I'm like kind of excited to go back to study, take my mind off things. And that's when I saw the pictures of the towers. And I was like, I thought it was a movie at first. And then it turned out it wasn't. I also remember, I had to mention this because I was, you know, this is how wrapped up I was in my own world. I remember being upset when they canceled classes. Because <laughs> I want to take my first class. 
instead, you know, they, they, they destroy the tower as they cancel classes. But anyway, um, went to class on Thursday, the first class. Got back, and I lived in this mobile home park, and across from me lived this old man named Arthur Anderson. Sweet old Arthur Anderson, my, to my eternal shame I've lost track of, but he, um, you know, I say hi to me as I came in, you know, from where I was going, and came in from class that afternoon, and he waved me down and said, hey, Derek, I'm going to a talk at my men's group today. Would you like to come? I don't, I don't remember how he, how he phrased it. I don't know the exact words. And I, was, I, I was like, I was like, okay, I guess. I, I don't know why I said yes, because I didn't really want to go. But um, turns out his men's group was at a, a church, uh, Holy Trinity United Methodist Church in Gainesville, Florida. And the, um, the, um, the talk for this men's group was on the problem of suffering. Uh, it was by a cancer specialist named James Lynch. He was an evangelical, if I'm not mistaken. Like I still have. I don't know what I did with it. It's around here somewhere. Um, he was giving a talk he'd given before. He had it made up into a little pamphlet. I guess he'd given to this other other uh, evangelical organization on the campus a few years ago. I still had the pamphlet. It's pretty good. It talks about the problem of suffering. talks about possible answers to it. That's what the talk was about. And, you know, about how you should grapple with why God should, you know, let you suffer, right? So all this is very, you know, in my mind and everything. It was a... I don't remember any of the details of the talk. I do remember it was, I was impressed by its honesty in a lot of ways. It didn't proclaim to have all the answers. Um, it was interesting. Anyway, after the talk, you know, I sat with you know, Arthur the whole time. I think I talked a little bit with Lynch afterwards and I'm about to leave because I think I drove, we drove together, I drove him. Anyway, Arthur turns to me and says, would you like to come to church? This is my church here. Would you like to come with to me, come with me to church on Sunday? And pretty much right then and there, I realized that would be as clear a sign as I would ever get. And, you know, looking back at it, you really can't, again, there's no, you know, you can, you can definitely, through reason alone, know that God exists. I don't know if through reason alone you can, you can believe he cares about you. Long story short, uh, I accepted and started going to the Holy Trinity United Methodist Church, which I did about, about a year, better part of a year. Got to meet Arthur, his kids, his family was there, wonderful, sweet, decent people. The people at the Holy Trinity Methodist Church were very, very nice people. Methodists in general are very nice people, I find. But, um, and so started worshiping publicly. And it was weird. <laughs> it was strange. You go there with this sort of, I felt like it was like an like almost like a needle or something stuck in my in my chest because you have all these you, all this stuff going on but yeah it's like can i believe am i here can i believe you, you're waiting for any sign that like no this is all baloney i'm gonna leave at any moment never did uh, i don't know how often i went i know i went most sundays but um it's at this point by the way if you're wondering about reading i don't read too many things that got me into the church catholic or even this actually one of them is not catholic <laughs> it's weird um I began reading things like, uh, I should mention this because it was important for me at the time. I started reading, it's still in existence, this, uh, it's an ecumenical journal, but it was run by a, ca a Catholic priest, former Lutheran convert, um, Richard John Newhouse. Uh, First Things, I think Somerville had recommended it to me. It was helpful. Uh, I think that's also how I came, I think it's First Things that got me into uh, the novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky. Again, it was Orthodox, he's Russian, but he still, he became kind of a, huge part of me on the path toward Catholicism, even as I was going to this Methodist church. But I kind of knew I was there, not going to be there permanently. And just to answer, you know, any possible questions about, again, choosing between Catholic and Protestant, and it wasn't a big deal. The one, maybe the one, the one body I might have, or type of Protestantism I might have had something thing for, I still actually have a lot of respect for it, would be Anglicanism. You know, this goes back to my study in 17th century England. I knew a lot about its history. I admire some of its writers, uh, even some of its theologians uh, from that era. But eh, not really. I mean, it was never, I, I, never strongly. Um, and in terms of, and in terms of, like, if you, again, you're asking, you want to know what specifically about the church, why Catholicism? 
You know, two, th- probably two. Again, I, 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 people would ask me, and you know, John Summer will ask me when I, I told him I was going to the church eventually, and people ask me reasons why. And you know, the thing I remember thinking this it was a few years after this. People would ask me, oh, I knew Conver all this, and I'd give them answers. And I didn't realize it until a few years after this. Every time someone gave me, asked me this question, I was giving a different answer. And I would say, and I think this is because I think, in, in, a, in a sense, what made Catholicism the church seemed like so obvious to me was, um, you know, just the whole thing. Like I call it the allness of it, the completeness of it. It seemed to lack nothing to me. Anything that I could find in those other bodies, I could find in the Catholic church. Uh, But even more than that, it just seemed like it was everything, (laughs) you know? Uh, It just seemed like that. I would say that, and the second thing, and this is this goes along with it, of the Western churches, it had the best connection to the early church. That mattered to me a lot. I don't think, by the way, that, that's dispositive. A connection to the early church is necessary. It's not the only thing, but there was no question in my mind. And um, I say that, of course, because the other alternative would have been orthodoxy, which I confess I thought about it only briefly. And the reason why I didn't, and I, I don't, um, partly because I lacks the central authority of the papacy mostly but even at the time this was partly a matter of i've been reading all this stuff about western civilization i believe in western civilization i wanted to you know i had i had personal ties as well with uh, i did have you know my grandmother which it tickled her heart when i did that uh, obviously and i had a personal connection to it slightly i had no personal connection to orthodoxy <clears throat> and it was a little bit culturally foreign not a great reason, I think, to, re- to reject it, but it was it was kind of, yeah, it was kind of, at that point in my life, I had, it had to have that personal connection and that connection with the larger society I lived in. And I have no regrets about any of this, by the way. I'm not tempted by orthodox. I really, I really admire the orthodox, by the way. Um, I'm, look, I think they're wrong on certain, and I, this goes with Protestants and everyone else. Like, I think they're, they're wrong. I think they risk. They put their eternal salvation at the grave risk by not becoming Catholic, and uh, they miss a few things. And, and orthodoxy is a little different. It's the orthodox. The, it's one or two things, and that's it. Um, personally, you know, in principle, I have to call them schismatics and maybe even heretics or something like that. But in practice, got no problem. Like the orthodox, actually. <laughs> so, but don't believe it's the the fullness of the faith. I just do not. And so, um, I thought I actually did go through the process of, of inquiring about becoming a member of the of the Methodist Church that had only Trinity, but I knew what I was doing, and um, sought out the nearest Catholic church, which was the Catholic Student Center, the St. Augustine, Parish of St. Augustine, ironically enough, uh, in uh, in Gainesville, Florida, where. At that time, they had a, a, an inquiry session, they called it, on Thursday nights, where you'd go ask questions about the faith, and there's no no strings attached, nothing like that. I remember the lady, I can't remember her name, she was helpful. She remember her telling me a, a story. Uh, she was she grew up in Michigan, uh, Holland, Michigan, which, if you can tell from the name, it's Dutch, and so they're Dutch Calvinists, and so there's a lot of prejudice against Catholics up there. I remember her telling me a story, I've always found it delightful, like when she was a child, her father teaching her like where in like the Summa Theologiae, where in Thomas Aquinas you could find the teaching on angels. And she was like, yeah, he told me this when I was 10 years old. I was like, I, I told him I understood and I had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> but, but she talked about how her family had to prepare them for that because of that. Anyway, I went through it just to ask, I didn't have many questions at that point. I uh, did not. Um, I'd gotten my little prayer answered. And um, the, it went for like a month, like, like October, the end of November. Or so, um, end of October, end of November, and, and at that point, I was like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to come in." So, I uh, went through RCIA. Oh yeah, the RCIA program. That's another topic altogether. That could be a topic of controversies in church history. Anyway, or someone coming from the outside with no background, almost. Uh, I'll never forget. I had a sponsor, a man named Jeremy Jeremy uh, Jeremy Marabella. He was from Daytona Beach. Uh, doctor, wonderful person. 
uh, his girlfriend, I, they broke up eventually, but uh, Deepa was her name, was an Indian lady, very sweet couple. Uh, I think I still, yeah, I, I, I think I still, have, I still have stuff from my baptism. I don't know where it's at. I have like the certificate. I have all that stuff there. I still have the candle. Um, and um, I was baptized. Uh, I don't have the date here. Good lord. Um, I believe it's April. Sometimes in April, I have to go back and look. I'll find out at some point, but. Uh, in April 2003, at the church, uh, Father John Gillespie was the, the the pastor there at the student center. Um, <clears throat> baptized me, and uh, I, you know, I should, I guess, because I have a lot of traditionalists who listen to this podcast, came in through the through the new rite. Um, uh, it was about it was I have to say it was about as fulsome as it could be. I know I think in the older rite they have twelve what is it prophecies or readings. They only have seven. They never do more than one or two in most places for the Easter Vigil. Uh, Father Gillespie was a real stickler. They did every single thing, every single reading. Uh, it was, uh, I think the damn thing lasted like five hours, uh, the Easter Vigil. <laughs> I, was just, I, I, was, I wanted the whole, you know, I'll never forget, like that night, um, you know, being outside the church. The church is right along the um, street, uh, University Avenue in Gainesville cars wishing by as he lights the fire outside the outside the church and you process in a lot of the stuff um but i was especially especially glad the baptism baptism itself was a full-on baptism uh i i, I it was a big huge uh, you know i didn't pour it over my head i dunked three times i went under the water so um full immersion baby and I remember I was really cold in that air conditioning after I got out, too. Um, great memory. The only thing that I, it sticks in my memory, I'll mention this just for whatever. Uh, there was a young lady, uh, was really pretty, uh, handed me a towel. It was part of the RCA group. I really wish I'd gotten her phone number. I never did, obviously. I'm single now. But, um, yeah, I'll never forget the night of my baptism. Ever. Um so yeah, that was 2003, and it's been, it'll be next year, it'll be 20 years, a Catholic, and uh, I, this is maybe the one thing in my entire life I have never had really any regrets about, maybe the first thing, maybe the only truly adult thing I feel like I have ever done in my entire life, uh, I don't know, maybe this now, the podcast, I don't know, but um, but. Uh, it's been a long journey. It's still, the conversion is still ongoing, obviously, and I've gone through a lot since then, but I'm not going to go through that. This is all you're going to get um, uh, in terms of this this episode. Um, you know, I don't think I've had, I never really had any intellectual difficulties with any of the teachings of the faith. I, practical, again, I mentioned, I mentioned a couple of, I mentioned a couple of things. One is that I mentioned that, you know, life after death was always the hardest thing. Weird. But uh, I, I don't know why. I don't know why. Um, I guess I'm not a, I, mean, I believe in miracles. I don't, I'm not a big, you know, my sensibilities tend to be kind of naturalistic, but it doesn't bother me. Uh, it's always been easy to accept. That, yeah, miracles happen. I, one thing that did bother me at the, at the beginning was I didn't have a real emotional connection to the faith. And I knew that would, I knew if I could give my assent. Uh, then the, with my will and my intellect, it would come in time, which it has. But, um, you know, those sorts of things. I guess uh, maybe one thing I've I've never taken to as a Catholic too well. I do it more lately, but it's Marian devotion. I was never been, like, especially the rosary, never been big into praying it. want to pray it more, though. Uh, I've gotten more comfortable as I go. And I guess I, I don't know, I guess... You know, the image of Christ is really powerful as someone who suffers and, who, you know, is suffering with humankind. But I've always been I've always been more attracted to the more, the more I say, the more masculine image of him, like, you know, conquering sin and death. There's a famous image in the, the um, museum of the Cathedral Ravenna in Italy, uh, from like the third or fourth century of mosaic of Christ as a soldier. Like he has a cross laid across his soldier and he's stepping on, a, on an asp. That's kind of the image I wanted to see, basically. But um but yeah, not really, almost no intellectual difficulties and lots of other difficulties, of course. And I'm still going, still trying, still on the path to conversion. So, and yeah, which includes this podcast, which, you know, until someone stops me or drags me away, I will, I will keep doing. So 
that is all for this special episode of of controversy in church history the history of my baptism it is ancient history it's almost 20 years now so hope you guys enjoyed it uh if you like the podcast again go like and subscribe on your favorite platforms subscribe on my youtube channel like the uh, like the facebook page you know share with a friend please help spread the word get it out there um if you think it's be helpful to people i'm trying to help people that's all we're doing here so uh and go the website as well churchcontroversy.com check it out and uh, as always thank you everyone for listening god bless you all take care have a great weekend y'all